Hello, everybody. Welcome to the afternoon session. I am indeed Justin Ribeiro. I know it's been a long conference. It's been a good conference, lots of good talks. I will try to get through this as quickly as I can. But first, before I do that, I like to make a lot of noise before, you know, when we get started. Make the other people over there think we're doing something really important over here. May not be important, we don't know. So on the count of three, we're just gonna make as much noise as we can. It's the afternoon session. You just had a brownie. It's the 420 session. I don't know if that's relevant or not, but one, two, three, noise. <laughs> All right. Yeah, now let's talk about handling real-time data on the web. I am indeed Justin Barrow. In the bottom corner, I have started off with a little demo, which is hopefully working kinda, sorta, maybe. Yeah, it's working, that's a plus. All right, now we're cooking. So that is a timer that's running on my pair of Google Glass that is pumping data out and coming back all the way down my slides to a nice little web socket. So the long and short of it is, is that the timer application is written in Java, uses the GDK on Glass. Please hold your stones and the throwing of those stones until after the talk, please. Uh, I won't talk about Java. Uh, the MQTT broker takes the message from the timer, sends it down, MQTT, message queuing telemetry transport. It's a wonderful little service. Uh, so you can use that, it's open source. They have all kinds of implementations of it. It talks to the web server, which has a little socket. The socket pulls stuff off of a, of a preferred topic, at which point then it starts to listen to this thing through our JavaScript and updates as fast as we can. So that's demo number one, and we'll have a couple more demos as we go through. So what are we actually talking about today? Uh, we're gonna talk about the why. Why real-time data? Why should I know these things? Uh, we're also gonna talk about server-sent events and web sockets primarily. Uh, we're gonna talk about performance matters. Um, performance does matter when you're talking about real-time data. And we're gonna talk about callbacks, and that may, may, probably makes no sense at this point, but it will hopefully by the end. So hey Justin, like what about like WebRTC data channels? Like I hear those the like the really cool thing right now, and I have high hopes, but I've never used them in production, so I won't talk about them. Um, there's a great little article that came out on HTML5 Rocks last week. It's definitely worth a read. Um, we're not really going to talk about old browsers, blah blah blah, old IE, uh, poor Android, old Android. It's a horrible, horrible world. Uh, so we're just going to kind of skip over that. I will may briefly mention them. So. Why server sent events? Why web sockets? Justin, I have H XHR. I'm perfectly content. And I do not begrudge you that. XHR is great. It's great for that transactional interaction that we have with our users. When we have them do something that we want to send back and then get a return response. Works fantastic. Server sent events are a little bit different. We're talking about text streaming down to the client. So we can't really do XHR streaming purely now at the moment. So server sent events fills that gap. Web sockets are a little bit more complicated than that. So you have a great bi-directional interface. I can send stuff to it, it can send stuff back, we can have a whole conversation, and it can be fairly low latency, text or binary. Now, they're complementary and prerequisite. I have another slide of my daughter's, but this is daughter number one, Allie, building her watercolor bot. So we don't necessarily care which transport you use. I'm not here to tell you to convert all of your wonderful promises and XHR requests to web sockets or server sent events. That would be ridiculous. Um, but they're complementary and they each serve their own purpose. We're gonna talk about some of those purposes today. And I don't sell magic bullets. There are no magic bullets here. Please don't ask me to sell you magic bullets. The reality is, is that it is what it is. The propagation latency of, both, of all three are the same. You, you're, you're not gonna send packets faster than the speed of light. It's not gonna happen, right? You, they at some point have to send a packet. What happens to it then? Well, that's propagation latency, yay. Server sent events and web sockets only truly remove the message queuing latency. So with XHR, you have the scenario of, hey, um, Maybe I have a long pull and I've got 60 seconds on my timer and I'm gonna sit there and wait. So the f it's a function of that. I have to wait 60 seconds. I don't know what happened on the other side. A web socket or a server sent event can remove that delay. So a very good read if you have not read it. I highly recommend it if you wanna learn a little more about the internals is high performance browser networking. This was actually in one of Dave's slides on, uh, in his keynote. Uh, I really love this book. It's an awesome book. I highly recommend it. So real time, at the top level sort of surface, looks pretty easy, right? Have you ever looked at the APIs? Here you go. Server sent events, let's wire one up. It's not hard, right? 
Oh, I got a little var there. I've got some returns. And oh, here you go. I'm open for business. I can stream some and listen to on message. Yippee skippy. Boy, that's easy. Justin, I no longer need your talk. Ah, oh, crap. We got to talk about IE and Android. Oh, I'm sorry about this. Uh, yeah, so I wasn't going to talk about them, but now I have to. So you think old IE, 6, 7, 8, uh, they don't have implement event source. That would not be shocking. Uh, but 9, 10, 11 don't actually implement event source either, which is somewhat disappointing. Um, so there's that. And then, of course, the only more recent version of Android, which is Chrome backed, is 4.4, only supports server sent events. Um, they have polyfills for it. You can see the link on the Modernizer Wiki for the polyfill options. Uh, and the reason I'm pointing out polyfills in this case is because it's going to come back in the talk later, and I will explain more. CSS or S SSEs, the good parts, can only be UTF-8 text, really easy to deal with. You apply your logic to your stream and you go forth. Uh, it's a consistent stream. It stays open as a long running stream. Um, it's got some really trick little things built into it that just takes out the, the headache for you. Um, primarily that it'll reconnect and start at a basically the last ID. So there's some nifty little things you can implement both on the client side and on the server side to deal with that. And the event stream is really just an HTTP stream. So the beauty of it is, is that you get the infrastructure from that, that you can use gzip and gzip the crap out of it, and then boop, it'll be nice and small. So it's really nice. Memory efficient. Once a message is processed, it's just gone, OK? So it's not queued up. So uh, an example of something that does basically store it entirely until the full message is done is XHR, right? So you have to wait until it's done, and you have this whole huge message, which is this whole byte overhead on the top. And then magically, now that's this big, horrible thing, depending on what you're returning. So uh, SSEs are nice, because it is pretty memory efficient. And then you can apply to this wonderful memory efficient thing, custom events. You can say, hey, I have some event tag that's come through on my uh, uh, SSE. And then magically, it, you can take that event and do whatever you want with it. Uh, and then there are some not so good parts about SSEs. Um, they can only be UTF-8 encoded text. Uh, maybe that doesn't work for you. Um, you don't get binary. So there's a hint. WebSockets take care of that. Um, you can kind of do binary with SSEs, but you don't want to. Um, the byte overhead is too high. You know, it's, you're not going to, the scenario does not play out very well. So please don't do it. Um, Lucy, Ethel and the Chocolate Factory problem. Everyone ever see that episode of I Love Lucy? Constant chocolates coming. That's SSE. Once you open that connection, you can't tell the server anything else. It's done. Like, hey, I'm open now. Oh, good. Here's your stream of chocolates. Please box them accordingly as you see fit. Um, the only way you can stop it is you literally have to close the connection down. So you can't interchange and say, hey, something's changed on my client side that you know, maybe my stream needs to change, or maybe I need a, an additional piece of data. Not with SSEs, no dice. Uh, and then there's, of course, the problem with the polyfill options. Um, so the SSEs are pretty easy to polyfill um, with XHR. The problem being is that XHR has a transport overhead. And it's pretty high. It could be 800 bytes, um, while an SSE could have two to eight bytes, depending on what you're doing. Um, realistically, XHR will polyfill it, but you're not going to get the actual benefits, per se. Like, it's going to work, and it may do what you want it to do. But you're basically falling back to a long pole solution that's basically not as memory efficient. Uh, you're, you're still going to incur some uh, message queuing latency in that. So you're going to lose the benefit, even though you've backfilled it. So if that works for you, that might be OK. But as we'll see, maybe it isn't. WebSockets also look pretty simple to wire up. I don't have to do much here, Justin. I still don't need your talk. You have an on open. You have an on close. Hey, I got some message on my data. Oh, no, an error. I should do something with it. Well, that's pretty much it. Looks pretty simple. But the devil with WebSockets is it's all about the details. You have a multitude of options with WebSockets that if you're not careful, you will find yourself in a world of pain. Uh, you have to know if we're text or binary. Are we implementing our own compression, or are we doing, or let, or are we letting the server do it? Uh, are we talking in a sub-protocol? Do we come up with our own application protocol that this particular socket needs to speak of? And then, wait, I still forgot what in the world was in my payload to begin with before I did all these other things. 
So you have to frame up that frame, Mr. McFrame. Basically, an on message can consist of binary or text data. So you can say, hey, is my event data an instance of a blob? Maybe I'm an immutable object, like an image, or maybe a video, or some such that you may want. Otherwise, do some texty things. So again, oh, Justin, I can check for a blob. That's no big deal. But you know, we can make this better. So let's say that you don't. Let's say you want that blob, but you know that it's basically going to be an array buffer coming back. You, that you want the browser to take care of some things for you. So we can force it and say, hey, the binary type is going to be an array buffer. Oh, by the way, here's my instance of yippee skippy. I have now checked, and this will work just fine. So, and it could still be immutable, I, I suppose. But then you're like, oh, hey, I have an array buffer. That's great. I've implemented binary frames. I'm doing something. I'm saving the world with less bandwidth. And then you're like, hey, my event data is an array buffer. And now I got to process that array buffer. And you're like, well, what do I do with that? So the wonderful thing that landed in Chrome M32 was that uh, we got per message deflate. Woohoo! Yeah! I see the excitement! I was really happy about per message deflate uh, because it takes out some of the headache of having to do your own compression in cases of where you don't want to necessarily do your own compression. Um, th there are some problems with it. Uh, it's still pretty raw. Um, this demo is actually using per message deflate. If you inspect the slides, um, you can see it spewing forth. Um, Problem is, is that it's not really per message, it's just all the time, and that's unfortunate. And then, of course, you could be compressing your own data with offsets. So has anyone ever used a C binary struct or anything of that nature? C, any C? I see a couple hands. Woo! C binary structs. So basically, you're saying, hey, my array buffer, it's this thing, and I'm going to use a data view because data views are very simple. Has anyone ever used data view in J JavaScript before? One, two, three, maybe? OK. So data view is nice because you can just say, hey, I have a particular offset of things. And I can say, hey, uh, go get me an unsigned int uh, at you know, offset 1 for byte 1. And then you've got an, an int 16 plus an int 8. That's going to give me an offset 3 against my next int. Or, I'm sorry, 16 and 8 is 2. That's, yeah, that is 3. That's right. Woo I'm on a roll today. So you can use this. But at that point, you're saying, oh, man, this is getting complicated. And this is the thing of WebSockets, is that WebSockets become a rabbit hole. There are lots and lots of implementation choices to be made. You have to decide which way you want to go. Because what happens is, is that the flexibility in a WebSocket is basically going to result in a massive amount more of application complexity on your client front end. So you have to make decisions early before you just say, yeah, you know what, we're just going to change everything to WebSockets, or we're going to change everything to SSE. Makes perfect sense. Eh, maybe not so much. Communication required. What does this slide mean? Obligatory picture of my twins, because they really like computing technology, which is scary at the age of two. Who are we communicating with? Oh, I'm communicating with the server, Justin. But the reality is, is that you have to talk to whoever's building your back end. Because unlike, you know, maybe it is you who are building your backend, and you have full reign to build whatever you want. But the architectural decisions that you make early on when it comes to WebSockets and service and events define what your application structure is going to be on the client side. Because if you're having to deal with array buffers and offsets, you have to define those offsets. Otherwise, you have no idea what that binary object could be. You have to make choices, which requires walking possibly to the next cubicle or wherever, however you work, and say, hey, backend guy, let's talk about WebSockets. I really want to use them for my awesome thing that I've decided to build. And you have to come up with a plan. So I know a lot of people say, er, backend things. Eh. I just need some JSON. Justin, just send it to me. Man, who doesn't use JSON all the time? OK, sure, let's talk about JSON. Let's talk about performance matters. So here's demo number two. Uh, demo number two is reported in temperature 78 with, uh, I don't think that's actually Lux, I think that's voltage, but basically that's a sensor we have running in the office. It has other things, and we're going to say this is a typical message format for that particular sensor, uh, because I like the M2M Internet of Things sort of experience. So we can say, hey, Justin, that's pretty small. I can look, I, you're updating things fine, like it's kind of blipping up and down whenever the light changes, yippee skippy for you. The problem is, is that's 93 bytes of a tiny little perfect JSON world. You know, ah, it works great for the one thing. But the reality is, is that it's not a perfect world. And if you don't communicate with your back end, you find yourself in a world of pain. 
Because there's, it's really easy when there's one, right? We can all do the one demo. The one demo is simple. You don't have to have a massive memory overhead. You don't, you know, you don't have to worry about repaint so much. Woohoo, my demo works. I have one thing. But the reality is, is that if you don't talk to your back end guys, the JSON could be huge. How many of you in this room have ever said, hey, I need uh, access to a particular set of data. Can you send me some JSON back? And they, what they send you back is 200 fields of completely irrelevant data. Has anybody ever had that happen to you? I see some hands. It's painful, right? You're burning bandwidth, and that is a massive headache. And you're like, well, Justin, I have bandwidth work. Uh, work bandwidth, there's a word. Bandwidth in my internal, app, you know, I have, it's an internal network, I don't care. Yeah, how many of those people also are saying, hey, why doesn't it work on my mobile phone? You have a problem, and you have to define why that JSON, what that JSON can be. And in the sense of M2M, and in, some sta uh, in most cases, game state, if you've ever built a game, you know that the resolution can be quite high. Maybe it's updating 20 times a second. And then in that case where you do have lots of game data or lots of sensors and you're trying to do a lot of work, uh, you end up with a scenario of, well, that 93 bytes on the back of the pack, uh, napkin math is eh, 1.8K a second. I have 100 sensors. That's 100 KB, 180 KB a second. Now, I'm going to steal something from TJ's slide uh, yesterday because he had a nice little quote in it, basically, that the, the average bandwidth rate is 1.4 to 1.6 in the US and the UK. Uh, does anyone know what 180K is? It's roughly 1.5 megabits. So <laughs> you've now burnt somebody's internet connection. And then the data center guys are going to say, what in the world is going on? One person is connected, and we're, like, we're, we're getting hammered here. This is not a happy scenario. So here's demo number three. Let's have some random updating things. So here's a whole bunch of sensor data, randomly updating, doing some magical things. It's a happy time for all. So as you can see, it's, you know, this is a little bit more hefty. It sends a, quite a bit more data. And again, you can inspect it in DevTools and see the WebSocket frames if you want to look through. And you will note that I'm sending a lot more JSON than it needs to be because uh, it's in debug mode, so it makes it a little bit easier to deal with. So we have a couple maker bots printing random things uh, from the design guys, and then we have some uh, just random sensors around the office. And apparently it's really hot in the office today. Jeez, what's going on over there? Everything is amplified when you deal with real time. You, again, it's not that one scenario. It's the, I have a lot of things scenario, and that has to be dealt with. I cannot stress enough that you have to talk architecture early before you just willy-nilly go and implement WebSockets or ser service and events. So now I've got all this data, and maybe I'm dealing OK with my JSON. Maybe it's slimmed down. Maybe I've taken 93 bytes and made it to 20, and I've got a little overhead. Now we have to update the DOM. And boy, isn't that a wonderful thing to do. Because so many good things happen when we update things like 20 times a second in the DOM, right? Depends on how you go about it. So we have a basic checklist that we, we, we deal with, and that's, does this data need to update the dome? So there are cases where you might say, hey, I'm getting the same piece of data 20 times a second. Maybe I don't have to update that so much. Uh, you would be surprised how much code I've looked at in the last six months where people don't check what's coming back, either on the server side or on the client side for sensor data resulting in a huge bandwidth bump and a huge just overabundance of memory on the server side and on the client side. Because you're not checking to actually see if you need to update it. And then, of course, you update the DOM, 1,000 nodes, 2,000 nodes, 10,000 nodes, and then guess what happens? It starts to crash. And then you have to use iframe tricks and all kinds of things. Can I batch it with other updates? I like to put this one in here. We usually don't batch because it's real-time data and it's, you know, you don't have to necessarily batch, but you could. Uh, should I be holding that dome element for later? Probably. We'll get to that. And then what's my reflow look like? Am I going to cause a massive paint problem? If you can, cache your update target. This is some just random sample code that is actually, I think, in this, on these slides right now that checks to see if the particular topic in question is cached, goes about, pulls a name, looks at the sub talk, it, uh, looks at the subclass and the spans, and then updates some things. While my implementation may not be ideal or the way you go about doing it, the reality is the concept should not be new. Uh, this is a pretty well-known thing, both for jQuery and just the DOM in general. You should be caching elements that you think you're going to need to reuse a lot. Don't sit there and rescan your DOM 27,000 times, which I've seen happen, and it's sad. So please, cache as accordingly. 
And then what if I need to update something? Well, if you want pure speed, and I realize I'm at a jQuery conference, text content is your friend. Um, text content is pure speed. Um, if you run the JS perf test against, say, .html or .text, you'll see a very wide gap. Um, now, this, of course, does not work in all cases. It depends on what sort of thing you're updating. Um, but if you have a purely sort of text field that you don't need to apply additional nodes to or you're not, you don't need to create uh, additional nodes or don't need to do crazy sort of class modifications, text.content uh, or dot text content rather is your friend. Um, it is really speedy and you can squeeze out a lot of performance uh, as opposed to say dot HTML. So and then one of the big ones, and this is a rather new one, uh, we've been doing this recently after a few articles last year, uh, layout boundaries. Anybody use layout boundaries before? One person. Layout boundaries are fantastic, and this is a particularly Chrome example, but you could do the same thing for Firefox if you determined what that layout boundary might be. When you're updating the DOM a lot with real-time data, you are incurring a paint Right? You're going to reflow. It's going to recalc what's going on and say, oh, I need to relay this page out every time. So what we have to do is give it a boundary that we try to contain the amount of things that it has to paint. All right? We, we, want, to want, we want to say, hey, don't go all the way up to the document node and just repaint everything. Because when you're doing 100 or 1,000 sensors or anything of that nature, you, just, you get really bad jank. Like it just, just grinds to a halt, and it's very not good. So this is a layout boundary. It's actually in these slides if you want to look at it later. Um, basically, they're pixel width defines. So that's one of the layout boundary requirements is that you have to basically pixel width your width and your height, and you have to set your overflow and your position. So position absolute and overflow hidden are pretty much uh, dead on easy. Um, pixel widths can be difficult, obviously, for all the same reason pixel widths are always difficult. But uh, you can ignore left and bottom. But the reality is, is that this contains uh, the glass little update node in the bottom to only repaint that spot. So it's really nice. Uh, it saves you some time. And I will show you the time it saves. So a great tool for this is uh, Paul Lewis's Boundizer. And then uh, Wilson wrote Introducing, uh, introdu uh, introducing Layout Boundaries. It's a great read. Uh, you can really pull out performance. So when performance matters, and for real time it really does, you can't be afraid to diverge as needed. You have to test and verify every little thing that you need, because once you start to scale up, it will come back and hurt you. Um, small optimizations at the beginning may not seem like that big a deal. I have one thing. It doesn't really matter, Justin. It's going to do that. I have 10 things. Still may not matter. My, my PCs are so performant now, woo! But the reality is, is that that's not the case because mobile's here. And while we have a four core, two gig uh, you know, supercomputer, as Scott mentioned uh, this morning in our pocket, the reality is that there are constraints. Um, you have latency constraints. You have the way the, the VM works on those things. Like, it's, it's a nightmare. Like, you have to deal with this now as opposed to later. Um, so by the numbers, there's a JS perf test if you want to see how text content compares to, say, .html.txt. I also highly recommend if you haven't used the J, uh, jQuery source fair, you can actually see that jQuery in certain cases does use text content, um, in, in particular for .txt when it pulls data. Um, the glass stat pack in the bottom, so originally the way I had written it, it would re basically every update would cause a, uh, a reflow of the entire slide deck. Um, when I change it with the layout boundary system, you go from 2.1 milliseconds of render time down to half a millisecond of render time. And now imagine as you multiply that out to many, many things across many sensors, you're gaining a huge win. So it's little at the beginning and it's huge at the end. Cannot stress that enough. Hey, Justin, you're at a jQuery conference, man. And I'm not seeing a lot of jQuery in these slides. <sighs> well, let's add some. Callbacks. Woo! Callbacks. I love callbacks. They are expletive awesome. They are internally used by Ajax and Deferreds. So if you, the, 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 the API documentation is available, obviously, on api.jquery.com. I highly like, recommend you look at callbacks and see how they operate within the scope of Ajax and Deferreds. And I thought to myself, hmm, maybe WebSockets would be really cool with Deferreds. That sounds kind of nice. Let's do that. 
All right, so I came up with a little something something called jQuery WebSocket Callback. And what it does is it wraps the WebSocket API and uses the callback framework that Ajax and Defer do in jQuery and uses a pub sub model. So MQTT uh, is a pub sub broker. So it's a hub and spoke model. You can have uh, bridges and all kinds of things. And that's how you grow at your pub sub system. Um, and it's based on that sort of observer pattern, right? I publish something. If I subscribe to it, it'll return back to me that thing. So uh, that's the basic sort of thing. And you, if you actually look, there's a, very, uh, there's a pretty clean example of a topic system, actually, on the, in the API documentation, which is really nice. So let's wire this bad boy up. I have a WebSocket. I'm going to go talk to Echo. And I'm going to say, OK, great, fantastic. Uh, on the topic WebSocket open, I'm going to subscribe. And whatever my open method is, I pass into it. It will run against that. Same thing with on message. I can sit there and send it to whatever custom method that you like. So immediately, you may say, ooh, that might, that's kind of nice. That means I could just you know, run a subscribe to pretty much all kinds of different scenarios within my application lo logic and keep things nice and clean, as opposed to just shoving everything into on message in the sort of you know, general wire up way. Internally, it's not much different. Um, what we're doing is we're saying, hey, on open, on close, on message. We are actually using it, the internal instance of it and saying, hey, OK, subscribe to a particular topic or publish to that particular topic. So in this case, we're publishing data against our on methods because we're like, ooh, I want that message. And then we're also subscribing to a WebSocket.send event. And you're probably saying, hey, Justin, what's going on with that send? So internally, like I said, it's subscribed to a topic. And we need to send something to that topic. So how do we do that? Let's sum some data. OK. We got our WebSocket. And we've got a particular topic we're going to send to, because we know it's inherent within the little API I've got. And we publish some data. And you're saying, oh, Justin, oh, it's so angry. That totally did not work. I got a nasty error message on Dev Console. What happened? Oh, I don't know how do we fix this. I do. Deferred. So what you can do is you can say, hey, on open. I would like to subscribe to my on open method. And at the bottom, we have a little on open method. And what we do is we set up a little deferred and say, hey, magical deferred. Here's a topic. When you're done, could you do me a favor and publish to this topic? And then we pass in our deferred into our magical my open method, and we resolve it when on open gets called. So what's going on here is that on open for WebSockets, if you try to send data, even if you have the WebSocket object back from it, it will not allow you to do that in the API. It'll fail. It'll just say, hey, um, you have to wait in time open. I'm not fully open yet. Uh, you know, it's like that time when you go try to get coffee and you know, the girl's like, oh, no, and you're not like, you're at the door. Like, let me into the thing. I need coffee. I'm sorry, I spent a lot of time in Seattle in the late 90s. So uh, coffee was a thing. Uh, but deferred as it is will run beautifully. And so as you can probably extrapolate from this is that you can sit there and go, well, I can do all kinds of magical things with deferred like I normally do with my XHRs, but in real time and nice, clean application logic across all the way. And what about server sent events? I've got you covered. I uh, also wrote a little something for this too. It works in a very similar manner. Um, obviously, you do not have a send event because you don't send things to a server sent event. Um, but the key thing that it's missing, if you go and try to use it, you're like, hey, Justin, why can't I subscribe to an event data tag that comes back for my server sent event? Yeah, I didn't build that. So pull request that if you like. Uh, otherwise, I'll probably do it later. They're both very early and young libs. The WebSocket one I've been using for a few months, it works pretty well. Um, there are some hiccups in the version I think I published on GitHub, but I will clean it up, I promise. Um, your mileage, of course, may vary, depending on how your application is set up. Similarly speaking, you may not have a pub subsystem for your WebSocket. Um, you know, it just depends, again, architecture. So with that, that jQuery plugin creation total gives me two and probably been about 7,000 or so. Uh, you know, I, that's approximation because I haven't checked Ben's repos today. And you know, he probably wrote four while I was talking. I am not catching up at all. So let's wrap up. Real-time data is hard. Um, the wire ups are particularly easy. The polyfill options can do work, but they have consequence. Um, it's very difficult to try to 
wedge everything in. Um, I have scraped the surface of this talk, really, uh, and I hope it propels you to go read the browser networking book, the API documentation. It's a very big topic. Um, you got to look beyond your code window. You have to go talk to people who you're implementing with and decide on an architecture. Otherwise, you'll have WebSockets for the sake of having WebSockets, and you'll have service and events that don't do anything for you. Um, deferred plus WebSockets equal happiness. Oh, how I love deferred. Source and whatnot, it's all on GitHub, so the links are in the slides if you'd like to get them. And that is the magical end. It's been such a pleasure talking to you all this evening. Thank you very much.